All right. All right. So today we're going to uh, start the beginning of the end here. Uh, we're looking at community ecology. Um, just have a few uh, things left to wrap up this week. Um, remember that on Tuesday, since uh, we're going to have the ACT, we're not going to have a separate lesson um, just because I know the juniors, uh, that's going to be a pretty intellectually full day for them. And so I don't want to put um, more on everybody's plate. But uh, anyway, we'll, we'll do this uh, today, take a look at community ecology. And then on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, we'll kind of wrap up uh, the last uh, of this. And then we'll have some time next Tuesday kind of to review as well. All right, so community ecology is the study of interactions of community. And that includes all the living organisms that live together in the same place. So think of all of the interactions, kind of looking at that picture there. So it's kind of, if since we've already talked a lot about population ecology or the interactions of uh, organisms that are members of the same species, we put all of the different populations together that are in a common environment and we get a community. One thing that's important to a community is that each organism has a role or each organism has a place. So we call this a niche. So a niche is an organism's uh, ecological role. It's a uh, habitat uh, you might think of is uh, its a specific living place where its niche is kind of like its job. So here in, in this example we have uh, something that uh, creates niches all the time which is called competitive exclusion. So if you look at this picture we've got some barnacles living on a rock and it says that if species 2 is removed then species uh, 1 would occupy this whole range. But at the lower depth, so deeper in the water, species 2 is able to outcompete species 1, excluding it from its potential niche, its potential zone. And so that's what's called a competitive exclusion, when one species is able to outcompete another uh, for a portion of its uh, potential niche. Uh, it has excluded that. And so these are partitioned now into uh, separate niches because of competitive exclusion. So competi competitive exclusion is based on the idea that no two similar species can occupy the same niche at the same time. So for example, lions and tigers are extremely similar in the niche that they occupy. And that's why you find them in uh, separate geographies, is they would be unable to coexist in the same niche at the same time. They've competitively excluded one another uh, from the potential niches, and their current uh, range is their realized niche. We also talked about resource partitioning, so that is another way to avoid um, competitive exclusion. Uh, so, for example, all of these lizards uh, have a, a similar niche, but uh, for the resource of shelter, they utilize different portions of that shelter. So one lives high in the treetops, the other one lives in low trees. Uh, some live on the ground as an ex ex examples, and you can see different examples here. So they've partitioned or split up that resource, that shelter, to limit competition and to save energy because it takes energy to compete. And hey, whenever an organism can limit the energy it's expending, that's a win for it. Then we get to the idea of what's called interspecific interactions, so interactions that occur between different species. And um, we like to classify these as symbiotic interactions. In uh, a competitive 
example, uh, both uh, organisms are at a loss because for one, you know, the uh, that one organism uh, is outcompete and doesn't get the food or resources. And while the other organism gets the food or resources, it takes a great energy cost to that organism. Next we have uh, predation or parasitism. That is when one organism benefits from a specific relationship and the other one it's to their detriment. So obviously the predator it benefits the plus and the prey is a detriment to the minus. We have mutualism or mutualistic relationship where both organisms benefit by this interaction. And then lastly, we have a commensalistic relationship where one organism benefits from a given relationship and the other is not really affected. So for example, barnacles that are attached to a whale, well, the barnacles benefit because they get to take in the nutrients from uh, the whale feeding and the whale is not really affected because the attached barnacles don't harm it in any way. Think of the, all these examples of symbiotic relationships. So cuttlefish and anemones, a spider eating this moth, species of bird that lays their eggs in other nests. Okay. Now we want to look a little bit more closely at predation. So predation drives illusion. Predators adapt to be able to locate and subdue their prey. So think about how a hawk is so exquisitely adapted to be able to be a hunting bird. And prey adapt to be able to elude predators and defend themselves. So look at uh, these organisms of the savanna with their horns their great speed and their coloration. And uh, even in plants, spines, thorns, or irritating substances like is in chili peppers. So predation provides one of the strongest selection pressures for both predators and prey because it's literally, in both cases, a matter of survival. Obviously, for the prey, so they don't get killed, but predators, if they don't catch prey, they lose a food source. So some defense mechanisms that predators are able to uh, adapt are camouflage or cryptic coloration. So look at these different images and see if you can see all of the animals in each of the pictures and how exquisitely they blend their camouflage to the natural environment. There's also uh, in a defense mechanism for prey of aposomatic coloration, which is uh, the tendency to uh, for especially uh, poisonous organisms to be brightly colored. So the poison arrow frogs, poisonous caterpillars, monarch butterfly. Then there's the case of mimicry. So like in Batesian mimicry, we have a palatable or harmless species that mimicking a harmful model. So this is um, a pupae of uh, a, a, a type of caterpillar, type of worm. And it looks like the head of this snake. And so this is an example of Batesian mimicry. This is obviously not a snake but it has evolved to look like the head of the snake. So there's the green parrot snake. There's the hawk, mark, hawk moth larvae. Look how similar they look, even though this one, the hawk moth larvae, not even very uh, da dangerous or harmful. Uh, then uh, we have Another case of the monarch butterfly, which is very poisonous, versus the viceroy bu butterfly that uh, is edible. And look at how 
similar they look. Or fly and B, you can look how similar they look. In the other case, we have malarian mimicry, which is when two or more uh, species look like one another and they're both dangerous. It's the idea of um, dangerous uh, species all kind of ending up having similar coloration. So a yellow jacket versus a cuckoo bee versus a honeybee versus a wasp all have similar appearances. Especially uh, the coral snake and the king snake. Look at how similar the coloration is. But the coral snake is very, very poisonous. King snake, not poisonous at all. Maybe you can see the subtle difference in their banding patterns. Here, the king snake, they have the red bands that are touching the black bands. And in the coral snake, we have the red bands touching the yellow bands. Now, of course, most likely if you're close enough to notice this banding pattern, it's probably too late. You kind of mentioned already, but coevolution is very important in a community. Coevolution is uh, kind of that evolutionary arms race where uh, a predator and a prey or a food source and its hunter end up uh, evolving in response to one another. So predator-prey relationships or parasite-host relationships, right? Long-term evolutionary adjustment between two species. So, for example, these bats have evolved very long tongues to be able to reach the bottom of the flowers on these cacti, and these cacti over time have lengthened the depth of these flowers so that the bats don't eat all of the nectar, and it goes back and forth and back and forth, and that's how each of them have such pronounced traits. All right. I think at this point we'll look at the rest next time. So this is all I wanted you to look at for today.